Hello, everyone. Welcome to another uh, business brunch. Uh, my name is James White, small business sales expert. And as you know, man's passionate about sales and everything business. And um, it's a real great privilege for me to have on the uh, session with me today a, uh, a guy I've got to know very recently, but a really great guy. And um, uh, we're going to talk through his story, his journey, and, and his impact on sport and sponsorship. Mr. Jason Ratcliffe. All right, Jason. Good morning, Jim. I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good, thanks. I'm really good. So, look, for, for, for those that don't know, you, you, and I'm sure they do know you, they've read your wiki page or about what you, who you are and what you've done, but just give them a brief, um, you, you were an, a, a, an established top quality sportsman playing cricket for, for many years and now you've got, a, you know, we're going to talk about the agency and what you do now and what you did at the PCA, but give everyone a bit of a potted history on you, on you and, and what you've done over the last 25 years. Oh, Jim, you're far too kind to use those type of words to, to reflect my career. Uh, let's be honest, I, I was um, a journeyman type cricketer. Um, I was lucky to play in two good teams. I played for Warwickshire and Surrey from about the late 80s till um, the early 2000s. And two, two really successful teams. So I was part of a squad, um, which was great. Um, from there, I went on to work for the Professional Cricketers Association. So I had a, a nice transition really into um, the, the, the players body. I uh, worked there for 16 years, I got involved in all sorts of things as that organisation was growing. And then most recently in the last four years, I've become an agent, um, the terrible agent as, as, as they're known in sport, um, largely in cricket. And I do some consultancy as well. I do some psychometric testing, leadership stuff and uh, mental health stuff. So quite, quite, a, um, quite a portfolio career really at the moment. You have, I know. You've got lots of lots of hands and lots of pies and lots of errors, which is good. But before we go into, um, you know, one of the things we'll put on here is your wiki page, and one of the, I think it's really important that we, we before we talk about some of the other stuff around sport and sponsorship, I just want to talk about mental health because mental health's been in the news this week. Obviously, there's the interview that happened on Monday night, and uh, and I know that when you were, you know, you spent 14 years at the PCA and you became deputy chief executive and and the. The PCA, by the way, for anyone looking, is the sort of the, the, the organisation that looks after all the players. And mental health was a really massive thing that you put on the agenda there, which would be interesting to get, you know, what what makes it so important? And I know it's key for you with the players you manage now as well, but mental health and making looking after people's mental health is so essential, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's very much in vogue now, isn't it? And probably in the last, I'd say, five years, there's almost been a, a tidal wave of, um, of awareness for mental health and well-being. I, I wouldn't go as far as to say as cricket was was the indicator, but I think cricket was very much at the start of the curve, along with organisations like Mind. I think we were fortunate because we had some really well-known people, Marcus Stress Gothic notably, when he came back from an England tour, who spoke about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, where um, the work that we did at the PCA um, started in connection with some of these people was that way back in those um, pre-2000s, uh, cricketers were largely on six month contracts so they played for six months full on and then most of the time they, they they found ways of earning employment salaries weren't brilliant they found ways of earning money in the winter and some people a large chunk of people just went abroad for the never-ending sunshine so australia um, south africa or new zealand to play cricket and there wasn't ever any guidance about what they should do when cricket finally came to an end so you had a lot of cricketers who just went uh, went along enjoying the ride, uh, so to speak, and, and doing as well as they could. And then, of course, when it all stopped, all the problems can manifest. Um, loss of identity, loss of earnings, no direction. And cricket had a really bad history of suicide, um, a, a number of notable suicides. And, there, and um, what really stimulated me when I joined the PCA was a book by David Frith, and it was called By His Own Hand, and it documented 100 suicides in cricket. Now, they weren't all in English county cricket, they were, they were worldwide and some were tenuous links to, to the professional game. But all the same, there were 100 suicides linked to cricket. And um, we, we, we just thought, and I'd, I'd witness things in dressing rooms, I'd witness how the mechanics work and how people, um, their behaviours changed. So we thought we've got to do something about this. Um, and that was it really. So sorry for, the, for a little bit of a long winded intro, oh. but that, that's really where it originated. And then we had Marcus Dreskothic and we've had Andrew Flintoff, we had Monty Panasar, we've had Graham Fowler, Mike Yardy, Tim Ambrose, lots of people, champions, if you like, mm. who've been brave enough to say, look, this is what happened to me and this is why you should take note. 
No, I mentioned it because I know that Andrew Flintoff and Marcus have both referenced you specifically as being someone that's really helped in that area. And I just think it's important when it comes to, um, you know, it just it was topical after this, obviously this week and what's been happening on Monday with, with Megan. And I just thought it was really um, important. And also mental health, I think, is one of the most important things for, for anyone in sales and in business. If you're not in the right mental frame of mind to do anything, you, you're not going to succeed. And, and it doesn't matter what it is, you need to feel comfortable and and it's so important that we bring it on the agenda, I think, that people's mental health is in the right place. Yeah. And Jim, just very briefly on that, I know this is a largely sales orientated um, session, but I think you're right to mention about the environment. It doesn't matter what whatever environment it is, but, but leadership and the culture that the leadership creates is really important um, in making sure that people feel in a good space to go and do that job. Um, and, and we haven't got time for it now, but I've got some lots of examples where where that's where that's been proven and, and shown to be to be. Well, right. that, well, that's actually a really interesting link, actually, because I know you also do some work in with the the league, you know, some, some football managers as well, and and helping sport as a whole. And that's one of the reasons why we you know we was talking about today and sport and sponsorship and how it links to business. But there are lots of similarities, aren't there? If you look at a lot of the areas of way in which you know great business. You know, businesses are led by their culture and the culture of what's created. And you look at a lot of the best sporting clubs, the, the, the culture of the, the environment that goes through that, not just the team, but the whole organisation is critical, isn't it? So sort of one leads to the other a lot of the time. And, you know, you generally see the organisations that fail are the ones that don't have great leadership and don't have great culture. Yeah, I mean, it's a massive subject, isn't it? And, and quite often people in leadership, they, they talk about the top of the organisation. But I, and I think in football, that's quite difficult for a manager to create the culture because it's dependent upon the people at the top of the organisation and live and breathe those values as well. And sometimes the board, um, whoever runs football clubs, and they're not completely connected. And so I think that's tough for in, a, in a football example. But yeah, I do strongly believe that leadership comes from the top. And if those values aren't installed all the way down, um, then you'll have pockets of people who are trying to do the right thing. But it really needs to be breathed, lived and breathed, doesn't it? It does. And, and it's difficult, I guess, for you as an agent now. And we'll talk about that. But because you've got, like, you know, just for those who are watching, you know, someone like Dom Sibley, the England desk opener, Craig Overton, Jamie Overton, Joe Denley. Um, you've got, uh, you know, a number of other players that um, Danny Briggs, you know, you know, there's some great players that you've got on your books that, that you represent. And I guess the challenge sometimes for them is because cricket is an individual sport, but it's also a team sport. So they're in the position where they have to be leaders themselves. And I know the way you work, you want them to sort of you know lead and, and be confident in who they are. But they also got to work in that team environment, haven't they? So it's, it's an interesting balance. Yeah, I think cricket's unique, isn't it, in that fact that it is a team game. It's very much team orientated. But when you're if you're the bowler or you're the batsman, you're on your own. Yes, okay, you're out if you're a bowler, you're out there in the field, so you've got 10 people around you. But when you're batting, it's you, your partner's at the other end, he's not facing the ball. It's you against every bowler. So it's um, it's an in, a very much an individual game within a team environment. Mm. Yeah, and it makes it, it's, it's, a, it's a big factor. But so you obviously, you know, you've moved into, you know, you've seen, I'm guessing in your time, lots of sponsors and lots of organisations. I'm guessing when, you know, when you were playing cricket, it was like the Benson and Hedges Cup. I mean, remember those days when smoking companies used to sponsor? I um, mean, you know, obviously you wouldn't get that now, but you've seen sponsorship involved in, in sport pretty much all of your career why what makes you think that you know why do organizations do it and how do you think they link the the element of what they do as a sponsorship through to, to sales and we're going to come on some other areas around this in a moment but but what, what do you think the reasons are that you know they get involved in this sort of stuff i think everybody has a, has a have different reasons don't they i mean at, the, at that level that high level of of sports rights it's obviously massive awareness yeah. and um and i guess with any, it, I think sponsorship, whether it's with a, with rights holders, governing bodies, or, or on a smaller scale with personal relationships, I think people need to go in with a, with a clear objective. Okay, what do I want to get out of it? Um, because it is a relationship, and in theory, it should be a mutually beneficial relationship. I think if people go in with that um, that that um, rationale, and they both, and, and again, it comes back to relationship. It doesn't just happen, does it? You shouldn't just have a sponsorship and then it's just left. And it's left to organically grow. Relationship needs to be nurtured and developed, both sides, both people working towards it. Um, so, look, it's it's a um, it's not a straightforward answer I'm giving you because you know you're, we are talking about multiple ways of, of sponsoring. Uh, the objectives need to be clear um, from both sides, but um, largely you're hoping for visibility, aren't you? You're hoping for visibility. You're hoping for a, a mutual benefit, a beneficial relationship, and an, an association. And if those things are the, the the foundation, then 
um, especially in the modern modern age now, and certainly the last ten years, there's lots of ways to activate sponsorships, aren't there? Um, social media being being massive, television, broadcasting, you name it. Yeah, but, and, um, and using content. I mean, so, so one of the other things that you know, and I, I talk a lot about in the sales environment is around content. So content is critical. So if you've got content that can help you. Uh, advocate you what you do or bring knowledge or show examples of things and a, and a good example maybe that um, we'll do that so we've worked with Jason one of my clients called Trade Nation uh, we've worked with Jason and a player of uh, in you know, a couple of Jason's players actually so so Dom and Craig um, and Craig Overton you know an England test bowler Dom Signal an England test batsman well, what Trade Nation are doing is that they'll look at creating some fun content involving the guys. We played around a golf at the Oxford actually, I think it was, wasn't it, before uh, before Christmas, before before lockdown happened, and we did some content around that. And what that then does is it, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's an ethos behind that, which then gets people to have a look at the brand. It gets them to have a look at the brand. It gets them to think, who are these guys? And the goal for sales in all cases, you know, the, for the holy grail of all sales, is how do you get people to be aware of what you do and how do you get them to come and look at your site and look at what your business is and then decide if the, the profile you've got there fits for them so i think that's a, a great opportunity where some of the stuff we've been doing is, is helping drive um, that sort of awareness isn't it yeah and i think it's but when it's um when it's a smaller level of sponsorship it's it's harder isn't it because um it, from a social media point of view you're relying on activation you know your your marketing um side of things you're relying on on activating that through through channels um so i guess you there's more emphasis on on how you do that and then i guess um, old pr as we used to know it becomes becomes important doesn't it someone actually doing a proper pr job to make sure there's an awareness there but but i also agree with you about content it seems as though um interesting content is the way to grab attention because i think we'd all admit especially during the last year even on places like linkedin now it's a wash with people um, wanting to have their voice isn't it so how do you stand out from the crowd and get noticed and quite often it is by being different and interesting it, it is and it's also about making sure the other key thing i talk about with sales is about congruency so for example if you're a brand and you've got a, a, a brand that you want to, you know, at the end of the day in sales, you know, there's the old Jordan Belfort stuff that we all know. People will make a decision based on you as a salesperson. They'll make a decision based on your company and also the product or service. Well, if the company that you that you have is, is associating itself with certain individuals that people look up to or that people respect or that people feel are good guys or good ladies that work in a certain environment and that don't, if you like, you know, court controversy or whatever else, then then actually people make an association between that 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 person, that player, that team, and then link the two together. And and I think that's certainly one of the areas where I know that that, that type of activity can really drive a huge amount of, of leads, which you can then obviously hopefully convert from a sales perspective. Yeah, and there's a danger there as well, isn't there, um, from a reputational point of view? And I think that's where the diligence comes in before you you enter into agreements that you you are entering into the right. Where you know both parties are we happy with each other? Um, I guess when you're looking singularly, big organisations. Uh, I noticed Dove do a big campaign with a rug, with an England rugby player, don't they? Yes. Yeah. So, um, if if that person happened to do something wrong, then that could have. As Tiger Woods, I guess, was a good example many years ago. There was significant reputational damage, wasn't there? But, but that's that's in the minority. I think largely, the associations are thought through. There is diligence, and as you say, Jim, they, they can work nicely. They can, but like you saw with the horse racing stuff a couple of weeks ago with Gordon Elliott, where that went through. I mean, and there were a number of sponsors that were really keen to say, look, we don't want to be associated with it. So it can have, like you say, it's got to be thought through because if you're going to do a sponsorship deal either with a player or with a team, you've got to make sure you get a chance to understand who that person is, what drivers, what values they've got. And do you think a lot of organisations go into these sort of sponsorship deals? I know you don't because you're very diligent in what you do and that's why we've you know, gone on in that way. But I think a lot of people just sort of take the money, don't they? And sort of say, oh, I see it as an opportunity to, to take, the, take the quick buck. And actually then there are repercussions afterwards for that. Yeah, and I think that works both sides as well. I think when we when we talk to the top about how the relationship and it needs to be mapped out and it needs to it needs to have a plan. I think if you just think it's a good idea and you don't have that um, that communication that plan in place, it can fall down on both sides. Um, so yeah, t totally agree. People need to have to, to manage their expectations. You know, what do, what do I want to get out of this? And as the person or the or the group being sponsored, what what are we going to give back? It's certainly not a one way street of taking money. Um, as the uh, as the recipient of a sponsorship and thinking that's it, um, 
I mean, if anything, Jim, I don't know whether you'd agree with this. I think, you know, nowadays, especially because things are tough largely, you know, we need to be looking at ways where we can over deliver back to the sponsor. Mm. Um, like in any environment, isn't it? You know, you want you want to do a good job and you want to you want to over deliver. You want to make sure the relationship's good and strong, because hopefully you'd want that con to continue moving forward. And that's a really great point. I'd also say to you about from a sales and sponsorship perspective. If you're thinking and watching this and thinking, and oh, by the way, you know, if you want to, you know, talk to me, we'll, we'll introduce you to Jason. Jason's got some great players that are open to sponsorship, I know, but 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 all jokes aside, I think I know one of them is actually, uh, I think one of your lads is sponsored by a, a B4 member, I think, isn't he, Jack? But um, but uh, but but look, you know, I think that the, the reality is the, the key thing is, is is getting, like you say, that plan of what you want to achieve and what the, the guys can do and having, you know, a, a the one good thing about sports people and sport is that they generally, you know, they have a bit of a, an aurora, a, a, a aura about them, don't they? You know, they literally, you know, if you if you a um, if you're a sports person, in, in, and that's why a lot of the cricketers and sports people tend to move into sales roles, isn't it? Because they find it very easy. If you if you're a business, you know, buyer, and someone that's an ex-professional cricketer that you watch or a sportsman that you watch comes knocking on your door asking for a meeting, you generally say yes, I'm open to the meeting because it sort of opens the door, doesn't it? So it's quite interesting that a lot of cricketers and sports people go into sales environments. Yeah, I think that's true too. Um, largely, sports people are outgoing. Not all of them, of course. There's a mix of introverts and extroverts, but. I think there's, there are a number of things that make sports people really good in a sales environment. And the first thing I would say is they're outcome focused. Mm. Um, you know, that they, they, they know what the, the end result is. Um, they're determined, they're committed, they're professional. I think they are good at networking. And as, as you say, Jim, um, it, you know, it can be a door opener, can't it? And sometimes in sales, that's what you need. You just need the door opening. Um, and I think that different story, that different background can be can be a nice, um, nice attraction, can't it? But um, yeah, I think pr professional discipline, hard working, all those things are um, good, good attributes, good transferable skills from sport into business and particularly into sales. Yeah, and we've talked a lot about how, like you say, and go back to the you know the comment around the, the branding and linking the organisation to a brand, you know, and, and what they can do, and you know the, the idea, you know, when you say, when you talk to your players and say, you know, I've got this deal for you, it's worth this. But it's going to involve, you know, three presentations and three dinners and three or whatever else. What's the general reaction you get from some of your lads and ladies that you you do this with? What's the sort of is it like? Oh, do I have to? Or I know your guys are pretty good at that sort of stuff. They get it, don't they? I think every, every, um, a lot of sports people are, are similar. I think that's the really delicate element of my role is, as you say, Jim. You know, look. First of all, there's an interest and there's a potential deal on the table, and it's X amount. And then that, that's the part where the agent has to say, well, you'll have to do X, Y and Z. Um, look, yeah, I mean, the, the relationships that, that, um, that we're involved in and we're doing, I think the, the modern generation are well versed in, in this aspect we, we spoke about. Mm -hmm. You know, this is mutual. You know, don't just take something and think that's it. Um, and certainly that's the, the emphasis that I put on um, to, to my guys. And I think, you know, from a sports person's point of view as well, there's another, there's another aspect to this. I think that if, if people are really thinking, sports people are thinking properly, they should be entering into uh, sports um, personal relationships, sponsorships, um, not just thinking about the money, but they should be thinking about broadening their horizons. They should be thinking about meeting new people. They should be thinking about the future, you know, post-sport. And, and I, I refer to this at the top, you know, there were many people before in sport. I'm pretty sure most sporting organisations cover this now, where it was just about living for today. And I, I get that. But um, uh, coming back to planning, you, you need to have a plan where, you know, what will you do when it ends? Whether that's next week, which could happen with an injury, next year in five years' time, what will you do? And therefore, a personal sponsorship and the networks and the broadening of horizons and the education about business, it could be a future job. Um, so I think cricketers, in particular, sports people need to think that way. This isn't just for now, take the money and run. It's a far bigger, um, far bigger aspect. I think that goes for the sponsor as well. The sponsor realizes that those, those are the, that's the way a, a sports person's thinking. Then you've got you've got a fantastic foundation to, to flourish and, and make sure the relationship works. Indeed, and it's great. And there'll be a lot of business owners watching this that are thinking, "Well, I'm not big enough to be able to to do sponsorship deals, and I'm not." You know, they think sponsorship deals are multi-million pound elements, but they're not. All 
deals, are they? There, there, there are some really good deals that can be done, especially especially if businesses in Oxfordshire are watching this. Where especially, you know, one thing I would say is identify your target. You know, if you know your target market is, you know, for example, I'll give you an example of Trade Nation that we're using with Craig and Dom. Trade Nation's target market they work with is, is, a, is a male age, you know, 25 to 35. So actually the guys that we're working with fit within that profile. So people, it, it, there's, so you've got to know and, and, and work in, 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 that, in that way. But there's a real, there's some really some nice opportunities there for smaller businesses as well, isn't there, to take involve involve themselves with a with a sports person who then is committed to them and vice versa. Yeah, and I, I think it doesn't necessarily have to be cash or, 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 or money, does it, Jim? It could be something in kind. Um, you and I have had conversations about this and um, about ways that someone might be helped without actually having money. And again, my point of view would be um, if you if you, you are looking to go into this sort of thing, um, don't just think money. Think think mutual. Think something that might help you, but also might help them. Um, so I would push some people if they if it was right to to take something, take a relationship or an ambassadorial type agreement if it ticked a number of boxes like like we're talking about. Um, so it could be some that just just something left field. It could be someone who who can put some really nice video footage together for for somebody. Um, which they couldn't do anyway, which which of course is going to help their their profiling as they as they grow as a sports person. Just just something a little bit left field, but it, it could be a number of things. You mentioned Jack, so that's Jack Brooks, um, uh, um, uh, the Oxfordshire legend that Jack is now with Somerset. Jack does some stuff um, locally. He's connected to Oxford United, big Oxford United fan, and he's an ambassador for for Chadlington. Uh, Chaddington Brewery, who uh, um, connected to B4, so uh, that, that's another good example, really, um, where it doesn't, it's not massive, but it, it can work for both parties at a certain level. Yeah, indeed, and I think it's a really good way of using those examples. And I think one of the other things, from a sales perspective, that I would say that you know, you, you know, because the conscious con the discussion is around sales and business. So if you're thinking of looking at working with like an ambassador or, or a player that you, it fits your target market. And have a look at maybe, you know, what you can do is potentially run a Q&A with them or an event. So one of the great ways in which you could do this as a small business is you could say, OK, we're going to work with player X. Um, and, and and I know I'm talking to you about a player at the moment, which is, you know, a, a deal for, that we'd look, I'm looking to do with you. And actually, the idea that you might then do, so if, if people wouldn't come along to a Q&A or webinar about your product or service, you can do a Q&A with that player. So you link it and you might say, right, we're going to do a Q&A with player X. And you might do a top and tails. You might do it, by the way, this is sponsored by so-and-so. And at the end, we're going to do a competition where you can win a day's golf or a day's you know, cricket or do something with the player. So you link that as part of the partnership. And what you'll find is that there are people that maybe wouldn't have been interested before in work, maybe what your business does, but because you're now linking to that sports person, they then feel like they want to come along because they want to hear the sports story. Because sport is one of the things that captures people's hearts, isn't it? Whether it's cricket, football, golf, netball whatever the sport is there is some absolutely you know people are they, they look up at their sports people as, as idols don't they yeah i think that's a really good point because uh, i think what you're describing as well is you're creating affinity with your with your businesses aren't you mm. if you can create more of an affinity and you can use a sports person in this instance as a way of doing it with a q a as you describe or potentially like an ambassadorial type sponsorship where where that sports person actually makes some calls to your clients you know, and it could be about anything, couldn't it? It could be, you know, it could actually be opening doors and fulfilling sales or, or trying to get in the door. But it could be creating affinity in, in wishing the chief executive a happy birthday or, or something like that. Yeah. Small, small things, small, small things that aren't necessarily considered that could create massive affinity for the relationship. Um, so I guess coming back to you, the original point, that's creativity, isn't it? How, how can you think creativity, creatively? And realize that actually some small things could have a massive impact to your bottom line yeah and, and, and i think you know nowadays as well the other key thing from a business perspective to think about is that players do have a huge social media presence and social media is really critical isn't it i know we've had a couple of conversations with a couple of your players when i've been saying i've had a look at the social presence and i've said sorry it's just not big enough but whereas some of the others it's like yeah okay so so one of the things that again from a sales and business perspective is if you can partner with some people that have got, you know, and again, Jack, I'm sure, you know, talk to Jason if you want to have a conversation around Jack. Jack's got, you know, 25,000 followers on Twitter. And, um, you know, I know Craig and Delm and, you know, these guys have got thousands of people that follow them on 
social media. So if there's an opportunity to, to actually do some partnerships that are targeted in that area, then there are some real great value opportunities for, for, for businesses to, to engage with and work with, isn't there, that can, that can, that can, that can really make it, you know, I always say to people that you've got to try and work out where those, where those opportunities are and you've got to speculate to accumulate in some cases. But if you've got a, social, a sports player that's got, you know, we, I, I, you know, we've just done a deal for. Uh, I can't say the name of the person, but we've just done a deal for a, for what, for my client um, to to engage with someone that's got 1.2 million followers on Twitter, right? So <laughs> when they post something on on social media, that's going to reach a significant amount of people. Yeah, and I'd describe that as as an easy win. Um, uh, so it wasn't really an easy deal to get done, but it was easy. <laughs> the guy we talked to. No, I'm joking, but it was good. Yeah, well, I think it's a significant deal, isn't it? But I guess the the, the warning on that is that, and and the young youngsters nowadays seem to be pretty savvy on social media. But you know, after everything that's happened in the last few weeks, and we're seeing you know all of the topics that are in society, you know, sports people. So the footballers, um, and is, is race issue really, isn't it? Where sports people are being um, are, being, are being battered effectively and it's not just sports people it's not just racist racist issues the, the keyboard warriors so there are people certainly in football that have been told to come off their social media and I, and I don't think it's just as easy as to think oh so and so's got a lot of people I think it's part of your planning and your procedure yeah. and your diligence in saying okay he's got he or she has a number of followers but how does she use social media now you know, is she credible what, or he or she what, what do they say what do they do because that needs to fit with your organization yeah. you don't necessarily want to link with people that um that don't operate in the same way as your business because that's going to reflect um so sometimes the numbers don't need to be massive they it just needs to be quality that goes out yeah. and quality likewise on the rest of their grids whether it be twitter instagram facebook or, or even linkedin no, it's a really good point. And an example being again of you know the client again that, that I work with who are, who have a, a model around no shortcuts to success. They know trading is difficult, so they're doing all of their brand ambassador partnerships, and we've done a few of them. Are all focused on actually people having to work hard to get results because they know that in their industry that they you have, they have to do that. So it's about like you say that plan about knowing where your brand is and what your products and services is. How does it approach? You know, how can you uh, make sure that you what you do is 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 present within the marketplace? You know, you you, you can. It, um, what's the word, word trying to word that but the, the point is you, you've got to have a clear identification of who you're targeting and what you can offer to that market and if you can then use the allegiance the partnerships with you know or sponsorship with with teams then then it can work really well and and look what i would say is you know we you know there's there's deals that are done sport i think we're really, you know before we finish off i know time's a little bit short and i you know, appreciate your time this morning you know a lot of sport organizations have struggled in the last 12 to 18 months with covid as well so there are some really great deals out there aren't they in terms of um and for values that are maybe a bit more than a bit you know a bit different to what people expected so i guess it's always worth having that conversation with agents like yourself or with me if you want to talk to me and say you know they're interested in chatting to a couple of people and we'll put them in contact yeah absolutely and then when you talk about the landscape jim you know the, the, uh, we touched on it so they're, they're classic contra deals aren't they so it might not have to be cash but they might be things that are, that are mutually beneficial i mean don't 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 ever think that sports people don't um, that won't accept money and i'm not saying um, look there might not be many but it's but it's what i'm trying to say is don't be shy in asking you know if you if you see an opportunity and you want to find out who who the player is represented by in any sport you know don't be shy in doing that because you'll you'll all know as business owners or people in 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 sales orientated um, jobs um it's ideas generative isn't it how can you keep coming up with ideas that are different that might just activate um your plans and your strategy um so it doesn't necessarily have to be classic as we've spoken about, we have talked about a lot of classic stuff, haven't we, mm. in marketing and certainly social media. But um, there's more than one way to skin this. There is, and I go back to the, you know, I always talk to people about the five key words of sales: problem of one, understanding, belief, and trust. And if the sports sponsorship or the sports pass, you know, agreement you can do can help build trust for your brand and what you're doing, then it's in great shape. So, so look, I know we're running out of time. So, um, look, it's been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you and talk through uh, things here. I know. How can people reach you? Um, I know you've got Jata as your uh, as your business. So how can people reach you if they want to reach, uh, get in contact with you? I know you're on social media as well, basically yourself. So, how can they get in contact with you? Okay. Um... Yeah, my social media is JD Ratcliffe. That's um, for Twitter and Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn as well. I, I like to stay active on LinkedIn. And if someone, if people want to direct email me, I'm on J, easy to remember, J at jattermanagement.co.uk 
or j at jasonratcliffe.co.uk but you'll find me quite um, quite easily on social media or linkedin and if he doesn't reply to you quickly because he's out on a bike because he loves his bike he loves his bikes uh he's right he's cycling and um by the way me i'll tell you about the challenge me and richard did you know me and richard rosser from b4 did edinburgh to oxford in uh, four and a half days i think it was so there you go so we well, might have to do a charity bike ride with b4 again we might have to get reinstate that you'd be up for that i know you would yeah, anything to do with cycling, gym and B4, especially around Oxfordshire, um, count me in. All right, sounds like a good plan. Look, absolutely brilliant to have you on board, mate, this morning. Thanks ever so much for your time and really interesting to give your insights into, into sports and sponsorship and, and players. And um, yeah, and look, yeah, I know you've got some big deals to go and work through and players are nagging you to get them more, more money and more deals and opportunities, but you're one of the good agents I know. So it's been great to <laughs> chat to you and really, and I'm not saying that all agents aren't good, but I know you're definitely one of the good ones. So thanks for your time, mate. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Jim, and good luck with look. Good luck to everybody out there in Oxfordshire and, and in the B4 network, and hopefully catch up again sometime. Thanks a lot. We will do great. So there was Jason Radcliffe. So we'll, we'll catch up with Jason in a sec. Um, it's all about sport and sponsorship and how you can use sponsorship in the right way. As I've mentioned, if you are thinking around this, it can drive leads and opportunities into your business. Build a right plan for it. Make sure that what you're working with has a target to your audience and, and see how you can build those links and affinities and, and you look at clever ways in which you can drive leads and people using these ambassadors to, to get access to opportunities and uh, some good things can happen. So that's it from the Business Brunch today. Hope you've enjoyed. If you have, let us know. Uh, share it, please, on social media. If you haven't, then let me know and let Richard know because he probably won't want me to back in. But let's see. Hope you've enjoyed it and uh, we'll look forward to seeing another one with you really soon.